The passage for today is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 17, and can be found on page 310 of the Red Church Bibles. 2 Samuel verse, chapter 7, verses 1 to 17. After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, Tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people shall not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, who I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. Thanks so much, Hannah. Hey, guys, welcome. My name is Robbie. Let me add my welcome to, um, to James and to Sarah. If we've not met before, you're so, so welcome to St. Andrew the Great. I'd love to catch up with you after as well. You're so welcome to stay too for lunch. I really hope you can make it for that. We're going through um, 2 Samuel this term, and I'd love you to keep open 2 Samuel chapter 7, because that's what we're going to be spending some time thinking about this morning. It's one of the great speeches of God in the Bible. This is his kind of, I have a dream moment. Do you have um, a book on your bookshelf or your parents' shelf or something like that? It's like a kind of top 100 speeches in history or something like that. It's the kind of thing that like HSPS students and history students bring to University in Cambridge to look really clever. And the kind of thing that math students and engineering students bring to show that they can actually make friends with other people. Um, sorry, if you are a math or engineering student, you're very, very welcome. I know that you, um, you guys can make friends. I have some friends who are math students. <laughs> but it's that kind of speech, isn't it? It's like Martin Luther King or Winston Churchill or JFK or Emily Pankhurst or Margaret Thatcher. It's up there, but even better. The words of this speech in 2 Samuel chapter 7 are words which changed the world and actually are still changing the world. As I said, this term we're going through 2 Samuel. It's a book about leadership. It tracks the rise and fall of three great leaders. Samuel, that's the guy the book's named after. Saul, the first king in Israel. We thought about him a bit last week. And David. We're going to spend most of the rest of the term thinking about David and his reign it's an important time in Israel's history. There's this kind of transition to being a monarchy, having kings for the first time. But the message of the book is not so much how to be a great leader, even though it's about leadership. And there are lessons to learn, actually, about leadership. The main message of the book, though, is not that. It's more, what kind of leader are you following? Christians are those who follow Jesus Christ as king. We talk about 
God being our, uh, Jesus being our king and we, the kind of kingdom and what it looks like to live in the kingdom, kingdom values. We talk about your kingdom come in the Lord's Prayer. Now, I know there are lots of opinions about monarchy and kings and queens and stuff like that. It can, for some people, perhaps young people especially, feel a bit old-fashioned or quaint to talk of kings and, and monarchies and thrones and stuff. But this book, in part, is given to us so that we see what it means that Jesus is our king, that God has made Jesus our king. And so that we are motivated to trust him more and follow him more and look forward to and enjoy life in his kingdom forever and ever and ever. This book kind of frames kingship for us and the kingship of Jesus in particular. Now, I said already we had David um, last week, 1 Samuel 16, we looked at. It's the kind of first time we got introduced to him. It's actually not till another 19 whole chapters later that he's made king over Israel. That happens at the beginning of 2 Samuel. There's loads of stuff in there. If you've not read it before, I strongly recommend reading it. It's a brilliant little bit of the Old Testament. There's fights and plots and intrigue and tension and battles and exciting and all the rest. Um, this chapter picks up basically towards the end of David's reign, actually. It's not quite in chronological order, these chapters. Things are going pretty well. Look down at verse 1. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. You can almost imagine David and Nathan sitting out one evening, maybe they're on the roof terrace of his beautiful palace in the warm evening air, sipping a couple of beers, talking about the way that God has been good to Israel under David the peace that there is with all the enemies, the prosperity in this great palace that's made of cedar. Now, that doesn't mean anything to us, but back then it was like the bling, the Old Testament bling. If you had a cedar, cedar palace, then you are really living life. Look at this luxury, God, uh, David says. I get all this cool stuff, but the Ark of God, well, in comparison, it just sits in some tatty old 200-year-old curtains. The Ark of God, if you know anything about the Bible, you might know this. It's the kind of symbolic dwelling place of God. A little wooden God, little wooden box that God told Moses to make to put the Ten Commandments in. And it's kind of been with the Israelites all throughout their history. The chapter before describes how David brings the Ark of God into Jerusalem. And it's a great time. He dances for joy because the Lord's presence is with them. It's holy and precious and special to have God with them symbolically in this ark. And it lives in a tent, also called a tabernacle. Now, you can imagine, it's been a long time since this tent was built, was, was kind of woven together and, and, and made. It's probably by now, to be fair, looking a bit tatty. And David thinks, time for an upgrade. Nathan, the prophet, doesn't even feel they need to consult God. Great idea. Although they don't mention the word, they're talking about building a temple for the ark of God to live in. And you think, yeah, good, of course. Go, go do it, Nathan. Whatever is in your mind, go ahead and do it, verse 3, because the Lord's with you. Other nations have temples and gods. Even God himself, back in Deuteronomy, talked about building a temple, so go for it. And it does seem like quite a good idea, to be honest. David is a, is a godly guy. But sometimes, even a plan with the best motives can go slightly off. It turns out that God has something even better in mind for David and for his people, something way beyond what David could possibly have imagined. It's as if David is dreaming of putting a man on the moon, and God says, look, I'm going to send the whole human race to the very far reaches of the universe. Verses 5 through 16, what God actually says to Nathan, are sometimes called the Davidic covenant now, covenant is a key Bible idea. It's kind of like a promise or a pact or a treaty that God makes with his people. God is a covenant-making God. Making and keeping promises is, is one of the things that he does best. It's been right there since the very beginning of the Bible. You remember that God creates the whole world, and then Adam and Eve rebel. There's, the sin, there's sin and the fall, and it's what kind of makes the world such a messed up place. Human rebellion against God. But some of the first promises to put that all right are made right at the very beginning of Genesis. He promises that he's going to fix the problem of human sin. He promises that he's going to bless the world through one man and his descendants. And there's promises and promises all through the Bible. This is one of them, another chapter in the story of God's gracious dealing with humanity. It's the flowering of promises in the Old Testament 
And it becomes the foundation of some promises for the rest of the Bible too. And there is loads in here. If this passage, um, 2 Samuel chapter 7, was a meal, it'd be like a a really delicious three-course formal. But I'm afraid I can't really give you that. So we're just going to have like a healthy snack. We've only got sort of 15 minutes or so left. Um, Three things I want us to see, though, that should be good for us about what God is like, the kind of God that makes this covenant promise with David. Three things I want us to see. Firstly, God's humility or his, his condescension, his coming low. Have a look at verse 5. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? It's kind of emphatic in the Hebrew. The you there is really like, it's deliberate. It's like God is saying, look, David, in the economy of how things work, that is not what happens. I'm not the one that, built, that needs things for me. I do stuff for you. God doesn't need you to build him anything. He's great and mighty, the creator of all things. Do you really think he actually lives in that tent? Of course he doesn't. The whole of the heavens are his tent, it says that in Isaiah 40. God doesn't need anything from us. He is the all-powerful, uncreated creator of all things. He is from himself. Which is a good reminder for us, isn't it? Sometimes people talk like they need to make God look great. I don't know if you've ever heard that described sometimes. It's a kind of a Christian union might say like, oh, we're going to go out there and we're going to make God look great this week or something like that for one of their events weeks. But, but God doesn't need us to make him look great. Or sometimes people talk about, you know, defending, defending the Bible. We need to go out there and defend the Bible. Charles Spurgeon once said, I love this little quote, the word of God is like a lion. He doesn't need us to defend him. Just let the lion loose and the lion will defend itself. God is great and needs nothing from us, but there's more to it, I think. Verse 6 in the NIV misses out a little word that's there in the original, for or because. Are you the one to build me a house? Because I've not dwelt on a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt until this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I've moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to their rulers, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why haven't you built me a house of cedar? It's like God saying, look, there's a reason I've been in a tent. It's because I've been on the move with my people. I've not settled because you guys haven't settled. I've been in tents because you've been in tents. For 40 years out of Egypt, through the ups and downs of the wilderness, the disobedience and rebellion, for hundreds of years of the judges where there's been turbulence and mess and sin, God has been with his people through it all. Wherever they've gone, he's gone. It's amazing humility. He stooped low, They lived a vagabond life, and God showed his readiness to identify with them in the midst of it. And he won't rest until his people have rest. What David misses, I think, in in his kind of plan to build a temple, is that although things are pretty good, although some of those promises that God has made are beginning to be fulfilled, God's plan to restore humanity, to fix the problem of sin forever, is not even halfway done. There's still a lot more to come. Yeah, there will be a physical temple. We'll think of that in a second. God, uh, David's son, Solomon, actually builds a temple for the ark, and that's cool. But the reason that God doesn't allow David to build a temple is in part, I think, because when it comes to putting the world back together, there's still more tabernacling for God to do. There's still more living in a tent. As one writer puts it, at the heart of the Davidic covenant is the Emmanuel principle. Remember what Emmanuel means in the New Testament? God with us. It's no surprise then, is it, in the beginning of John's Gospel, where it describes what happens when Jesus came to earth, God made flesh. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling, literally tabernacled amongst us. Jesus was willing to be homeless for the sake of our redemption. The Son of Man doesn't have a place where he may lay his head. He showed this exact same humility that God shows here to his people. He stoops low and condescends to be near us and with us. And it's the same now. We're beyond the halfway point, if you like, of God's promises to restore humanity. Jesus has come, but we're still waiting. And as we wait, he is with his people. 
It might be in the midst of the stress and anxiety of work, all the struggles with mental health or a chronic illness that just won't go away. Or the feeble attempts to share faith with friends. I see a number of pursuit um, fleeces out in the uh, congregations today. They look kind of cool, don't they? Maybe you're thinking, oh, I could never wear one of those. I just feel so embarrassed. Or maybe you're wearing one and you think, oh, I'm kind of wearing it, but I don't know what to say. I have no idea what it's going to be like to share my faith with friends. But Jesus says he'll be with us. God's humility to stoop low with his people. That's the first thing I want us to see from this little um, this, this, this little bit in 2 Samuel 7. Here's the second. God's grace. His grace. Look at verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you. Now... I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. As if God's saying, look, David, when it comes to relating to me, it's not about stuff that you can do. It's never been about that. It's not about paying me back for all the gifts I've given. It's completely the other way around. I've given you all this stuff, and I'm going to give you even more. You're not making me great. I'm in the business of making you great great. One commentary I read this week compares this chapter about the building of a temple to other descriptions of ancient Near Eastern kings building temples for their gods. So apparently the archaeologists have dug up some of these different inscriptions or writings or whatever about different kings and the way that they build temples, because it was kind of a common thing. So like ancient Egyptians or ancient Assyrians or Babylonians or whatever also built temples. But basically there's a pattern in every single one of these that you read. The king says something like, Lord, I'm going to build you a temple, or God, or whoever you are, I'm going to build you a temple, and then please will you do this for me? If I build you a temple, then I really want peace and prosperity in my reign. If I build you a temple, then will you kind of, you know, let the succession pass to my, my son and his son after that? You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But that is not how it works with the God of Israel, the God of grace. He says to David, look, remember the journey I've taken you from taken you on. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, as in like the lowliest job that there was, and I made you king over my people. He is the God who exalts the humble. That's just what his job is. It's what he does. But it's not just that. Look what I'll do next, verse 9. I'll make you a great name, like the name of the greatest men of earth. Verse 10, I'll establish and secure a home for my people Israel. Just as an aside, notice how closely related the prosperity of the people is with the prosperity of the king. It's really good for the people when the king does well. And that's why it's great that Jesus Christ is our king. It feels a bit old-fashioned, but the more connected we are with him, the better it is for us. Verse 11, I'll give rest from your enemies. Verse, second half of verse 11, I'll establish a house for you. God takes the initiative to bless and bless and bless and bless David. Every good thing in his kingdom comes from God. I, I, I. It stacks up this kind of first person verbs. We don't do things for God. He does things for us. And that is the essence of grace. What was true for David, how much more true is it for us in the Lord Jesus? The more we understand that God is like this, he's a kind of extravagant overabundant giver of grace, the more we'll be able to enjoy him. I don't know whether you're feeling a bit flat in your Christian life. Sometimes that can happen to Christians, can't it? But what we don't need to do is sort of step it up and do God a favor in order for him to kind of come back and for him to feel close again in our lives. Just turn again and receive his abundant grace and mercy. You might have been sort of drifting away. This is your first time back in church for ages and you feel far away from the Lord. You don't need to step up your game in order for him to love you more. You just need to receive his grace. And if you're not a Christian, if, I know that we often have people who are kind of exploring Christian faith or just looking in. This is right at the very heart of what Christians believe. It is the beating heart of the gospel, the good news. It's not about stuff that we do, but about receiving the gift of Jesus Christ. David doesn't deserve what he gets, and neither we do. Neither do we. 
But God lavishes it on him anyway. Have a look and see God's extravagant generosity and kindness, his grace. Here's the third thing I want us to see about God. His eternal kingdom plan. His eternal kingdom plan. So far, the promises here have been mainly about David and his kingdom. They're kind of in that quite immediate time frame. But from the second half of verse 11, so the kind of final paragraph of what, he sa- of what God says, the perspective shifts to a bit more in the future. In fact, quite a long way in the future. Look at verse 11, second half of. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. Now, you have to kind of clock. I'm sure you've got there already. But there's, there's a bit of wordplay going on with the word house in this chapter. It can mean sort of three things. So on the one hand, David lives in a house. It's like a house of cedar. It's like a palace. On the other hand, he wants to build God a house, like a temple. But here, God is using the word to like kind of house of Fraser or house of Windsor, more like a dynasty. You can almost imagine him smiling at his own pun. Ha <laughs> David, you want to talk about houses? Well, let me tell you about houses I'm going to raise up your offspring, verse 12, and establish his kingdom. His throne will be, verse 13, forever. Your house, your kingdom, verse 16, shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God is in the business of making David into an eternal dynasty, the kingship of David into an eternal dynasty. And in the short term, this actually happens. So verse 12 talks about an offspring from your own flesh and blood, who will, and God will establish his kingdom. And you can read about in 1 Kings, Solomon, one of David's sons, who becomes king, and things go really well for Solomon. And he actually is the one who builds him a temple. But the, word, the words about the temple, verse 13, it's only a very few number of words in Hebrew. It's not really what this chapter is actually about. The Lord does establish a dynasty as well that lasts quite a long time, basically 400 years. There are Davidic monarchs on the throne of Israel. Even the sin of David's descendants can't stop and thwart this plan. I think that's what's going on in verse 14 and 15. So he talks about this very close relationship between um, the sons of David and God. So I will be his father and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I'll punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Now, all that stuff about a son and a father, it's tempting to get really excited as a Christian and think, this is Jesus right here. But then it's a bit, what's going on with the punishing and the sin? I think in the first instance, it's showing us that not even human mess and rebellion and sinful leaders can get in the way of God's plan. Because he's going to treat David's descendants with grace. So we had a bit of Saul last week. Do you remember Saul disobeyed God? And so God treats him fairly. He gets what he deserves. He cuts off the kingdom. But the dynasty of David is going to be different. It's going to be based on grace and sonship. He will punish and discipline the sons of David. Sometimes there'll be kind of rulers and things that do not do very well and do pretty horrible things. And God will treat them sort of like this here with the, with the discipline that he talks about, the discipline of a father and of a son. But he won't abandon his king and he won't abandon his people. He will not withdraw what it says in verse 15, his love. My love will never be taken away from him. And again, this happens. God sticks with the kingdom even when things get really, really bad in one and two kings. But the fact that we even have a promise like this shows just how far we need to go in order for that stuff about the eternal kingdom and everything to be fulfilled. The thing is, we don't need a king that God's kind to or gracious to. We need a king who is perfect, a king who will rule in perfect justice and perfect peace. Just as an aside, a bit of a help to reading promises and prophecies in the Old Testament. Sometimes they can have more than one level of fulfillment. So I don't know if you've ever been like walking in mountains or something like that. And you see in the distance all the different mountains kind of in basically one flat line on the horizon. Some of them are high and some of them, you kind of know that they're all there. But the closer you get to them, you maybe go up the first peak or something like that. The more you realize actually what's coming is perhaps even higher. 
There's another one behind that one, and then you kind of go up the second peak, and it's like, oh, no, that's not the top either. You're going to keep going. It's a little bit like that sometimes with Old Testament prophecy. In the immediate kind of, the immediate fulfillment of this prophecy is Solomon and David's, David's sons and things like that, the kings that follow after David. But there is one who is the true son of David and son of God, who does no wrong, who takes the rod of men on our behalf. These promises, like we were seeing and singing in our song, find their yes and fulfillment in Jesus Christ. He is the one who has a throne that lasts forever. Death can't cancel God's promise to establish his throne. Sin cannot destroy the promise. Time doesn't exhaust it. There's a kind of inevitability to the fact that God is keeping his promise through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm aware that reading a chapter like this can feel a little bit abstract. It's like one of those speeches in the kind of hundred best speeches in history. They're kind of interesting, but are they really related to me? But I think there's two big ways in which this really cashes out in our lives. The first is kind of general. We follow and trust a God who keeps his promises. He is in the business of making promises and then sticking with them. Which is an incredible thing for us, isn't it? Because as I said earlier, we're, we're sort of half, we are past halfway the plan to restore the world. But there are still things that we wait for. We long and pray for God to come for Jesus to come back and to establish his kingdom forever. We look forward to, like we were singing in the song earlier, to a gathering around a throne um, where the lamb sits forever and ever, praising and worshipping him, where there'll be no more sickness or dying or pain or sin or suffering. We look forward to that and we're not quite there yet. It may be that there's a bunch of other things that you're waiting for and you're not quite there yet. But we trust and follow a God who keeps his promises and the second big take home, I think, is that Jesus Christ is a king, is a king like this. He is the king who will establish a throne forever and ever and ever. God keeps his promises. The promises find yes in King Jesus, our Lord. So this has just been a little snack. There's so much more of um, 2 Samuel 7 to get your heads into if you want to and your hearts a little bit later on in the week. But I hope that we'll be encouraged by our humble God who condescends to dwell with his people, our gracious God who gives us what we don't deserve again and again and again and again, and the promise-keeping God who can be trusted forever and ever. As we close, let's say a little prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you great thanks that this is the kind of God that you are. And as we live this side of Jesus, waiting for his return again, we pray, along with all your people, your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen.